We begin with breaking news from Russia. The prison agency there has just announced that imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny has died. Well, even in the early hours here in the Russian capital, people have come out to this scene uh, where Boris Nemtsov was gunned down on Friday evening. October 7th, 2006, Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya was shot dead while on her way to publish articles on Chechen violence. Her death happened to be on Vladimir Putin's birthday, which raised some eyebrows. But what happened next left Russians in shock. Here are some critics of Putin's who suddenly disappeared. Alexander Litvinenko меня перевели в меня и несколько моих сослуживцев перевели в самое секретное подразделение по заданию высших должностных лиц страны убирать неугодных людей. Lin Finenko, the man who allegedly knew Putin's deepest and dirtiest secrets, was known to have solved his own murder before it even happened. 1991, Alexander's criticism of Putin started when he was promoted from serving in Russia's KGB military to the central staff of the Federal Counterintelligence Service, or the FSB. Now, the FSB specialized in counter-terrorist activities and in infiltrating organized crime. Coincidentally, this agency was run by Vladimir Putin, setting up an encounter for both men. However, during his time with the FSB, Litvinenko discovered numerous connections between top leadership of Russia law enforcement agencies and Russian mafia groups such as the Solensevskaya Organized Crime Group. Now, he wrote a memorandum about this issue to then-Russian President Boris Yeltsin. And after mouthing off some of the underground dealings of the FSB in press conferences, Putin personally fired Alexander from the agency. Well, let's just say firing this man wasn't the best idea, because from then onward, Litvinenko took it upon himself to bring down the FSB, corrupt officials, and the man he now detested, Putin. In 1999, Litvinenko accused the head of the Russian Armed Forces of having organized the 99 Armenian Parliament shooting that killed the Prime Minister of Armenia, Vazgen Sarskayan, and seven members of Parliament. Then he wrote two books where he accused Russian secret services of staging the Russian apartment bombings in an effort to bring Vladimir Putin to power. At this point, Alexander already had a huge target on his back. But he wasn't willing to be silenced, like many other former agents under Putin's control. In one of the biggest stories he exposed, Litvinenko claimed that Putin was a file and that Russia's Committee for State Security KGB, knew about it. He also asserted that the FSB had possessed video footage and documented actual intercourse between Putin and some boys. However, Putin made sure to destroy that while in power. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that those are really strong allegations, but just like the many more he had made in the past, Litvinenko failed to provide any evidence, meaning no legal action could be taken. That notwithstanding, Litvinenko predicted that Putin might want him dead, because he simply knew too much. He sought asylum with his family in the UK, and once it was granted, he partnered with multiple media houses, granting interviews every other day and laying ridiculous claims without any substantial evidence. And just as he had predicted, his end came, but not in the way he might have imagined. November 1st, 2006, Litvinenko suddenly fell ill. Earlier that day, he had met two Russian ex-KGB officers, Andrei Lugovo and Dmitry Kovtun, at the Pine Bar of the Millennium Hotel in London. By the time he got home, he was shooting out bloody diarrhea and couldn't walk properly. Two days later, he was admitted to the hospital, and for several weeks, his condition worsened. But even on his deathbed, Alexander told detectives that he believed President Putin had directly ordered his assassination. His blood and urine samples were subsequently tested, and it was discovered that the cup of tea he had at the bar was laced with the deadly chemical polonium-210. Three days before his death, Alexander asked that photographs be taken of him and released to the public, and following that instruction were his final words. I want the world to see what they did to me. Now, after his death, a British documentary claimed that Litvinenko had been poisoned by the two ex-KGB officers he met at the bar. The documentary also claimed that they were acting on orders that had probably been approved by Putin. But while no evidence supports this documentary, Russia refused to extradite him to face charges in the UK. And consequently, in 2015, Vladimir Putin, who was now the Russian president, 
granted Lugavoy a Medal of Honor for his services to the motherland, raising further suspicions on whether or not he did have a hand in the death of Litvinenko. Sergei Magnitsky Magnitsky was a Russian tax advisor responsible for exposing corruption and misconduct by the Russian government and the Putin regime. And for these allegations, Sergei was arrested, imprisoned, and killed. For context, Magnitsky was an auditor at the Moscow law firm named Firestone Duncan. And under this firm, he worked specifically for one client, Hermitage Capital Management, an investment advisory company. Now on July 4th, 2007, Hermitage Capital's Moscow office was raided by 20 Ministry of Interior officers. These officers had a search warrant alleging that Kamaya, a company managed by Hermitage Capital, had underpaid its taxes. This made kind of no sense since Russian tax authorities had recently confirmed in writing that Kamaya overpaid its taxes. Even more troubling was that the search warrants permitted the seizure of materials related only to Kamaya. However, these officers went ahead to seize all corporate tax documents and seals for any company that had paid a large amount of Russian tax including documents and seals for many of Hermitage Capital's companies. Something wasn't right here, and Magnitsky launched a personal investigation to get to the root of it. Now, during his investigation, Magnitsky concluded that the police had handed over the materials seized during the raid to organized criminals. These criminals then used those materials to seize control of three companies managed by Hermitage Capital Management, fraudulently reclaiming $230 million in taxes previously paid by the company. He also claimed Russian police had accused Hermitage Capital of tax evasion solely to justify their raid and eventually to hijack those companies. However, here's where the real story comes in. Based on Magnitsky's findings, Hermitage Capital contacted the Russian government to take legal action against those involved. And instead of opening a case against the police and the thieves, Russian authorities opened a criminal case against Sergei Magnitsky. November 2008, Sergei was arrested and imprisoned at the Buterka prison in Moscow after being accused of colluding with Hermitage Capital to commit tax fraud. He was held for 11 months without trial, denied visits from his family, and forced into the extremely dirty cells. Due to this, Magnitsky developed gallstones, pancreatitis, and a calculus cholecystitis due to a blocked gallbladder. He complained about this but was given inadequate medical treatment. At some point, he was scheduled to undergo surgery, but it was never performed. Because they thought he wasn't actually sick, men only used his critical condition as an excuse to leave his cell and get better conditions. November 16th, 2009, just eight days before he would have been released, if he wasn't brought to trial, Magnitsky died. Prison officials at first attributed his death to a rupture of the abdominal membrane and later to a heart attack. It was obvious that these guys weren't even sure what had happened to him. And in the days following his death, reporters learned that Magnitsky had complained of worsening stomach pain for five days prior to his demise, while vomiting every three hours with a visibly swollen stomach. His death could have been avoided at all levels. From Putin's government actually looking into his claims to the prison wardens attending to him promptly, and as you can imagine, his death did spark nationwide outrage. In late 2012, the United States Congress, along with President Barack Obama, passed the Magnitsky Act. This legislation prohibited Russian officials suspected of involvement in Magnitsky's death from entering the U.S. or using its banking system. Russia and President Putin reacted by denouncing that act and asserting Sergei's guilt in crimes. However, nearly a dozen other nations, along with the EU, have either since enacted similar measures or contemplated doing so. To them and many Russians, Magnitsky's death was premeditated murder. Yuri Shikachikhin July 3, 2003 Yuri Shikachikhin, a top journalist and liberal lawmaker in the Russian parliament who accused Putin of organizing a series of terrorist bombings, died from a mysterious illness that shook the foundations of Russia. Yuri's earliest known works as a journalist date back as far as 1990 when he wrote an article criticizing the First and Second Chechen Wars, human rights abuses in the Russian army, state corruption, and other social issues. In the years that followed, he published an interview with a lieutenant colonel under Alexander Gurov's wing of soldiers in the Russian military. 
Now, this publication was one of the earliest that detailed the dark secrets of organized crime in the Soviet Union. This publication also added feathers to his cap, making Yuri become not just a journalist, but a well-respected political figure in Russia. The only problem was, it put a lot of targets on his back. Yuri, being an investigative journalist and a member of Russia's parliament, published reports about the high levels of corruptions in Moscow. One scandal in particular was that of the Trikita Furniture Store, which saw leading members of the Federal Security Services implicated in laundering millions of dollars. February 2002, he revealed that the Prosecutor General's office had received $2 million to quash an investigation into the scandal. And being the deputy chairman of the State Duma Committee on Security, he tried to launch an official probe that was unsurprisingly rejected by Prosecutor General Vladimir Ustinov. Shikachikin even wrote directly to Putin, asking to take over the case, which Putin agreed to. But when Yuri saw the case was dying down, he did the one thing that many say indirectly caused his death. June 2003, Shikachihin contacted the FBI and received an American visa to discuss the case with U.S. authorities. Almost immediately after doing that, Yuri was struck with a mysterious illness. Now, this illness was so severe that Yuri's skin peeled off his body and, one by one, his organs just gave out, before he was eventually confirmed dead. However, with his death came even more unsolvable mysteries. It was officially declared that Yuri died from an allergic Lyle syndrome, but not a lot of people believe this, and we'll explain why. Yuri was treated at Moscow's Central Clinical Hospital, and this is tightly controlled by the Russian Federal Security Service because it treats top rank in Russian officials. So, if the Russian government wanted him dead, there would have been no better place to carry out this job than at their hospital. Plus, his relatives were denied having an official medical report about the cause of his illness, and were also forbidden to take specimens of his tissue for an independent medical investigation. Now, this caused widespread speculation about the real cause of his death. Some say he was poisoned, while others say he might have been injected with a lethal drug at that hospital. But with all these speculations, none of them have been considered to be true. Boris Nemtsov People are tired of Putin. When he announced he would run for president in September, in order to rule for another 12 years, people realize that he wants to remain in power for life. Boris Nemtsov, known as one of the Kremlin's harshest critics, courageously challenged the same government he had once worked with alongside Vladimir Putin. However, as a consequence of his criticism, he was murdered. In the 1990s, Nemtsov was a prominent member of the group known as the Young Reformers in post-Soviet Russia. He rose to the position of deputy prime minister and was once considered a potential presidential candidate. However, Putin took over from former President Boris Yeltsin in 2000. Initially, Nemtsov publicly endorsed Putin's appointment, but over time, he became more critical as Putin curtailed civil liberties. And maybe as a result of that, Nemtsov found himself marginalized in Russian political circles. So in 2011, Nemtsov led major street rallies protesting the outcomes of the parliamentary elections and penned reports highlighting government corruption. Furthermore, he did face multiple arrests as the Kremlin escalated its crackdown on opposition assemblies. That notwithstanding, Nemtsov continued criticizing Putin and his regime. He criticized not only Putin's government as an increasingly authoritarian, undemocratic regime, but also brought the awareness of Russians to the widespread embezzlement and money laundering schemes going on right under their noses. These were all made known in a publishing he made around 2008, where he detailed the Russian political interference and military involvement in Ukraine, along with a bunch of other stuff that just marred the Putin government even more. Unfortunately for Nemtsov, the more information he divulged, the more certain people wanted him dead. At around 8 p.m. on February 27, 2015, Nemtsov condemned Putin during a radio broadcast and urged Russians to join his public march against Russia's military involvement in Ukraine. Three hours after that, this dude was shot and killed as he crossed the Bolshoi Moskodetsky Bridge near the Kremlin. He had just had a meal with his Ukrainian girlfriend, Anna Doritskaya. Nemtsov was shot four times, with gun fragments lodged in his back and head. As for his girlfriend, she was unharmed. 
Now, many journalists obviously believe his murder was politically motivated, and maybe it was. However, it wasn't enough explanation for the discrepancies in the investigation that followed. For one, the Russian newspaper Kommersant reported that at the time of the murder, all security cameras in the area were switched off for maintenance. The only video of the incident out there is one from a camera feed for a broadcasting studio, and it was taken from quite a distance. And at that exact moment the incident occurred, the camera was blocked by a stopped municipal vehicle. Also, Nemtsov's girlfriend, who was right beside him when he was shot, claimed not to have seen the assailants, despite being in such close proximity to the shooting. And what maybe no one saw coming was President Putin taking personal control of the investigation into his assassination. He told Russia's investigative committee, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and the Federal Security Service to create a single team to investigate this murder. And after two years of investigation, three Chechens were sentenced to long prison terms for Nemtsov's killing. But even with that, no one knows who ordered his assassination and the motive behind it. Anna Politkovskaya I think about this next, that the risk is in general part of our profession. Мы готовы. То есть, то есть мы, вот я считаю, что журналист готов, он должен смотреть на это открытыми глазами и понимать, что это может быть. Не пугаться там, не плакать отца. Politkovskaya wasn't just a critic of the Putin regime. She was a threat to the entire Republic of Russia. And while killing her wasn't ideal, it was a necessary step that had to be taken. Anna's clamping down on the Russian government began way back in the early 2000s when she wrote extensively about the abuse and corruption in Chechnya. In her writing, she blamed the violence in Chechnya on Russian military forces, Chechen rebels, and the Russian-backed administration led by Akhmad Kadyrov and his son Ramzan Kadyrov. Due to those writings, she was detained in Chechnya while working on another in-depth story about the violence and murders in the Russian Republic. One particular disturbing account she covered was that of a grandmother from the village of Tuvsvini, who suffered 12 days of beating, electric shocks, and being confined in a pit, despite not having committed any significant offense. Anna would successfully uncover a story of violence inflicted upon 90 different families in Chechnya. However, the government adamantly refused to allow her to share these stories with the world. As she prepared to leave the Republic, Anna here was abducted, detained, interrogated, beaten, and subjected to humiliation. She endured a mock execution using a BM-21 Grad multiple launch rocket system and was poisoned with a cup of tea that induced vomiting. Additionally, one of her abductors, a lieutenant colonel, attempted to the assault her, but Anna fought her way through that, and after enduring three hours of torture in the dead of night, she was finally set free. However, her tape recordings were confiscated, and all the stories she had collected were lost. Nevertheless, instead of abandoning her career as a journalist, Anna intensified her efforts to expose not only the violence in Chechnya, but also the Putin regime. After Politkovskaya became widely known in the West, she was commissioned to write a book named Putin's Russia, later subtitled Life in a Failing Democracy. This book gave a broader account of her views and experiences after Vladimir Putin became Boris Yeltsin's prime minister and then succeeded him as president of Russia. This included Putin's pursuit of the Second Chechen War and accusations of the Russian Federal Security Service establishing a Soviet-style dictatorship. This book made headlines internationally, and another attempt was made on Anna's life. Мне его принесли, и я практически сразу потерял сознание. September 2004, while flying south to help negotiate with those who had taken over a thousand hostages in a school in Beslan, North Ossetia, Anna Politkovskaya fell violently ill and lost consciousness after drinking a cup of tea given to her by an Aeroflot flight attendant. After landing, she was swiftly attended to, and medical examinations proved that the tea she drank was poisoned. It was by a miracle that she even survived, and at that moment, Anna knew that the authorities in Russia were after her, yet, filled with a perfect blend of fear and resilience, she didn't quit. And maybe if she hadn't done what she did next, she would still be alive. By this time, Anna had become a household name in most of Russia, and killing her would have done nothing more than prove all her criticisms right. Holding on to that thought, she requested a face-to-face -face meeting with Ramzan Kadyrov, the then Prime Minister of Chechnya. 
It was an encounter only a madman would dare to have. But Anna wasn't mad, only brave, maybe naive. During their meeting, one of Katerov's assistants had the guts to tell Anna that she should have been shot and killed on the streets of Moscow, while Katerov supported by calling her an enemy that needed to be killed. Well, that meeting didn't last long, but what came next was a fulfillment of their words. October 7th, 2006. Anna was found dead in the elevator in her block of apartments in central Moscow. She had been shot in the chest, in the shoulder, and once in the head at close range. Coincidentally, this murder occurred on Vladimir Putin's birthday, pointing fingers towards him as the instigator. However, as some form of vindication, he released a statement condemning the murder. I think that journalists should know this, in any case, the experts know this very well. Further investigations also revealed that on the day of her death, Politkovskaya had planned to file a lengthy story on the torture practices believed to be used by Chechen security, known as Kadyroyites. And in her final interview, she spoke about Katerov by saying, I dream that he was sitting on the court. И самая строгая юридическая процедура с перечислением всех преступлений с... She also described Katerov, now president of Chechnya, as the Chechen Stalin of our days. Some observers allege that Ramzan Katerov, or maybe one of his men, was possibly behind her assassination. But that's just a rumor. Politikovskaya's murder remains unsolved to this day. Natalia Estmerova что больше не буду безнаказанно бомбить села, похищать людей, потому что теперь есть организация, которая может спросить за это. 8.30 a.m. July 15, 2009. Natalia Estmerova left her flat in the Chechen capital Grozny and set off towards the bus stop as she headed for a meeting. This was her daily routine, but on this day, she wouldn't make it to the office. Just as she stepped out of her apartment, four gunmen already waiting grabbed her and bundled her into their vehicle before speeding off. Her abductors took her to Ingushetia, Chechnya's neighboring republic, and as soon as they crossed in, they brought her down from the vehicle, laid her on the ground, and shot her five times in the head and chest, leaving behind her purse, passport, and lifeless body in a pool of her own blood. Her crime? Well, it was simple. Exposing the Chechen violence and standing up to one of Putin's closest allies, Ramzan Kadyrov. Since 2000, Natalia had been working in Grozny for the Russian human rights organization Memorial. She bagged a degree as a historian from Grozny University, landing her the job as Memorial's leading Grozny-based activist. Her major role was to document and publicize abuses carried out by Chechen law enforcement and security agencies under Kadyrov's control. And by recording the stories of victims affected by the Republic's violence, she wanted to establish a higher truth in the region, as it was already shattered by conflict and moral breakdown. But this wasn't going to be easy. Every day, a queue of women would turn up at her office, telling her stories of relatives shot by Katerov's troops, missing sons who went out and never came back, houses set on fire by masked gunmen in uniforms, and many other stories you'd be shocked actually happened. Natalia would in turn document these stories and send them to multiple media houses and local prosecutors in hopes of getting some form of justice for those affected. One of the most brutal cases she ever documented involved a 20-year-old woman named Medina Yanusova, who was killed for allegedly plotting to murder Katerov. This woman, along with her husband and parents, were killed, wiping out her entire family in the space of a few hours. Dehumanizing cases like this led Natalia to be unwavering in the face of all the violence that sprouted from every corner. She continued to write articles and reports about the numerous disappearances, torture, and crimes in the Republic. She would collaborate with Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, making her an invaluable source of information for Western journalists who were scared to visit Chechnya. However, her journalism led to an uncanny confrontation with Ramzan Kadyrov, the man behind it all. Kadyrov is the head of the Chechen Republic. His violent tactics, dressed up as anti-terrorist operations, aren't just used against the unknown number of Islamist insurgents still held up in Chechnya's forests and mountains, but also against the wider, terrified, innocent civilian population. 
March 2008, Katerov summoned Natalia to a meeting where he expressed extreme dissatisfaction with her work and her opposition to his new law, which mandated that women wear headscarves. Their meeting yielded no positive results, and what followed next was Natalia's assassination. So after her body was found, Katerov openly denounced the murder and claimed it was carried out to discredit his office. Vladimir Putin also left a remark, claiming her abductors would be fished out. But not to the surprise of many, nothing happened. And the only man suspected to have been involved in her murder was killed by an airstrike a few months later. Stanislav Markelov and Anastasia Baburova January 19, 2009, two Russian journalists, Anastasia Baburova and Stanislav Markelov, were shot and killed by members of a neo-Nazi organization for radically opposing the Putin regime. But it wasn't just why they were killed that got people talking. It was how they were killed that sent shockwaves around Russia. Anastasia here was an active journalist involved in the anarchist environmentalist movement. She took a part in ecological camps and helped organize the Anti-Capitalism 2008 Festival. Meanwhile, Markalov was a Russian human rights lawyer who handled several high-profile cases, specifically those involving left-wing political activists. He also worked as a journalist advocating against police violence in Russia. Now, these two journalists were active in their different fields, but the one thing they had in common was that they were both anti-fascists. And as for Markalov, he took things a step further by representing journalists who found themselves in legal trouble after writing articles critical of Putin. For this, he became a target. On the day of the incident, 34-year-old Markalov was leaving a news conference in Moscow, less than 800 meters from the Kremlin, when he was shot nine times, killing him instantly. Anastasia, who witnessed the murder, attempted to come to Markalov's aid, but was also shot in the back of the head. Now, while their deaths did come as a shock, it raised a lot of questions. For one, Markalov was believed to have been a target due to one of his most recent reports, where he openly criticized the Russian government's actions in Chechnya. And secondly, there were discrepancies in reports of Anastasia's death. It was first reported that Anastasia had been wounded in an attempt to detain Markalov's killer, before law enforcement officially claimed that she was shot on target. Following their deaths, Around 300 Russians protested in Moscow, holding signs with slogans like United Russia is a fascist country and Markalov will live forever. Meanwhile, over 2,000 people took to the streets in Grozny when Russia's then-president Dmitry Medvedev and Prime Minister Vladimir Putin didn't condemn the killings or offer any condolences. Many other journalists linked their deaths to the pattern of Putin critics getting murdered in cold blood. But after investigations, the alleged killers were said to have been a radical nationalist couple associated with a neo-Nazi organization. They claimed to have murdered Markalov for his work as a lawyer. And Anastasia, well, she was just collateral damage. Mikhail Lezin Autopsy on the uh, body of former Russian press minister Mikhail Leshin has revealed he died of blunt force injuries to the head. Lezin was once a Russian political figure, media executive and special advisor to President Vladimir Putin. However, after a fallout with Putin and after facing certain allegations, he relocated to Washington, D.C., where he died under strange circumstances. June 6, 1999. Lezin was appointed by then-Russian Prime Minister Sergei Stepashin to head the Ministry of Press, Broadcasting and Mass Communications of the Russian Federation. Now, during this time heading this ministry, Lezin was nicknamed the Bulldozer because of his ability to get virtually all Russian media outlets under the Kremlin's control. And after Stepashin's brief tenure, then-Prime Minister Vladimir Putin retained Lezin as minister, and with his influence in the media, he contributed to Putin winning the Russian presidential election. So while holding his position as a minister, Lezin did get entangled in a few controversies. In turn, he led the Kremlin's efforts to censor Russia's independent TV outlets. But this plan was foiled after a U.S. senator called on the U.S. Justice Department to launch an investigation into Lezin and his immediate family over allegations of corruption and money laundering. It was asserted that he owned $28 million worth of assets in the U.S. The FBI, already involved in the case, discovered that Lezin acquired these assets during his time as a civil servant, 
and just before the FBI could probe him, Lezen was found dead. November 5th, 2015, Lezen's lifeless body was found in the DuPont Circle Hotel in Washington, D.C. Investigators didn't find anything that could have been linked to his death. However, after upon close examination of the corpse, it was discovered that Lezen was intoxicated the night of his death and probably fell multiple times, resulting in injuries that killed him. This was the stuff told in mainstream media. But behind the scenes, every investigative agency, including the FBI, knew that this case was murder, and either the Kremlin or Putin was responsible. In 2018, a secret report by one FBI agent alleged that Lezen was bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat. The report also alleged that the men were ordered by an oligarch close to Putin and that they were instructed just to scare and not kill Lezen. Now, the FBI has neither confirmed nor denied this report and further investigations don't in any way link his death to Putin. But given that they didn't agree on certain terms before he left Moscow, and given that his autopsy showed signs that he indeed was bludgeoned to death, Lezen's cause of death will forever remain a mystery. Sergei Yushchenkov Yushchenkov was one of the harshest critics of the Putin regime, blaming his government for orchestrating multiple shootings and bombings against its own people. And just when he decided to compete for a seat in parliament with the intention of disrupting the powers that be in Russia, he was murdered. Now, as someone with a military background, Sergei here was viewed as the most capable individual for reforming the Russian army. He campaigned tirelessly to abolish the Russian practice of conscription, reduce the army's size, and safeguard the rights of military personnel who faced abuse. But he wouldn't stop there. April 2002, Yuzhenkov visited the U.S. and informed them of then Boris Yeltsin's secret plan to start the Second Chechen War. The order was issued in response to a demand from 24 Russian governors that Yeltsin needed to transfer all state powers to Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. Yeltsin's order was set to be executed on September 23, 1999, the same day that the Russian FSB operatives were caught red-handed while planting a bomb in an apartment complex in the city of Ryazan. And while still on this path to exposing the Russian government for attacking its own people, Yushchenkov flew to London for the premiere of the documentary film Assassination of Russia. The film described the Russian apartment bombings as a terrorist act committed by Russian state security services. Yushchenkov decided that his political party was going to distribute copies of this film around Russia, so everyone knew the truth. The Russian government confiscated tens of thousands of this film. But Yushchenkov and his political party still found a way to smuggle and distribute this film in Russia. This, coupled with other investigations he was making, made Yushchenkov not just a target, but a threat. And there were groups of people who felt he needed to go. April 17th, 2003, Yushchenkov was shot dead near his home in Moscow just hours after finally obtaining the registrations needed for his political party to participate in the December 2003 parliamentary elections. Barely minutes after making the announcement to the press, he was gunned down. One Russian attorney, Mikhail Trepashkin, believed that Yushchenkov was murdered because he was the leader of an opposition party that openly challenged the power of the FSB and the Putin regime. Moreover, he promised voters an independent investigation of the Russian apartment bombings as a key issue of his election campaign. And truthfully, that attorney wasn't wrong. Just before his death, Yushchenkov received threats from a high-ranking FSB general, Alexander Mikhailov, and one of the people convicted for his murder was a member of Yushchenkov's political party. Talk about betrayal. Nevertheless, none of the convicted men disclosed had any ties to Putin or his government. Yet, a lot of journalists still can't seem to look beyond the disturbing circumstances surrounding his murder. Alexei Navalny Yet somehow, Alexei Navalny, Russian President Vladimir Putin's fiercest and most energetic critic, drop dead suddenly at a penal colony in Siberia. Now this is the most recent case of a Putin critic abruptly dying. And it's pretty twisted. February 16th, 2024, CIA-backed 47-year-old Alexei Navalny, a prominent critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin, briefly walked around his prison facility in a Siberian penal colony. He later reported feeling unwell before collapsing and never regaining consciousness. 
Russian authorities assert that Navalny's death occurred under these circumstances. However, journalists and citizens of Russia hold the belief that Navalny was murdered on the orders of Putin and that there are solid reasons behind it. Back in November 2010, Navalny posted these leaked documents on his blog, blowing some whistle on a $4 billion embezzlement scheme at the state-run oil pipeline operator, Transneft, and the claim was vigorously denied by the head of the company and the Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. The following year, Navalny founded an organization named the Anti-Corruption Foundation, with the aim of scrutinizing the corruption in the Russian government. This organization was shut down a few years later. But even before that, Navalny himself was convicted of embezzlement, further complicating his story with the Russian government, but not as complicated as the first attempt that was made on his life. August 2020 Navalny fell ill while on a plane between the Siberian city of Tomsk and Moscow. The plane was diverted to Omsk, where Navalny fell into a coma. He was then taken to Berlin for treatment, where it was discovered that he had been poisoned with Novichok a stealth nerve agent used in the Cold War by the Soviet Union. Now, This immediately pointed fingers at the fact that the Putin regime must have been responsible for the attack. This was coupled with an investigation by CNN, revealing that about 6 to 10 FSB agents had trailed Navalny for three years before administering the poison. Nonetheless, Vladimir Putin denied all allegations against his government and claimed that if those FSB agents actually wanted Navalny dead, they would have finished the job. Those words made headlines for weeks, and before anyone knew what was going on, Navalny was back in Russia. It was a brave move for him, but was also a move that led to his death. 2022 Navalny was arrested and subsequently sentenced to 19 years behind bars after he was found guilty of creating an extremist community, financing extremist activities, and various other crimes. In the days before his death, Navalny spoke to his family and could be seen in a video conference call with a judge, looking well, even making jokes. So how's it possible that in the space of two days, he ended up being terribly sick and now dead? And why did prison authorities deny his family access to his corpse? Well, even if there aren't any direct links, many Western leaders, of course, including Joe Biden, have categorically accused Putin of ordering his murder. Navalny's family and friends also believe that Putin has a hand in it, obviously, due to the long list of his critics who've met a similar fate. In Russia, at least a hundred people have been detained across the country for attending vigils and rallies for Navalny, and even more authoritarian moves have been made to disrupt protests in his favor. If by any chance we say that Putin did actually order his murder, and that of all his other critics, then what was likely the motive? Well, some say that from a political standpoint, Putin's running for re-election in March 2024, and every single opposition figure has been eliminated. If he wins, this would be his fifth term in office. Also, keep in mind that he's already the longest-serving Russian leader since Joe Stalin, and could surpass him if he runs again for office in 2030. So what does this really mean for Putin, for Russia, and for the world? What are the consequences of these mysterious murders? And where will it all end? If all of your political opponents are dead, in prison, poison, doesn't that send a message that you do not want a fair political fight? 